Hi guys, welcome to the video and welcome to DCS World. And uh, this video, obviously, it's going to be about DCS World, but it's going to be from a particular viewpoint. It's not going to be a review uh, and it's not going to be a tutorial. It's going to be about uh, some of the challenges that I faced in terms of uh, getting into DCS World uh, as a platform and some of the challenges that I suspect many others will have faced about it. Um, and uh, from there, where I'm at now. But before we go into that, we're going to do a little bit in terms of the context, particularly with my relationship with uh, Combat Sims, um, which I suspect may uh, resonate with uh, quite a few people out there. So I started simming in the uh, mid to late 80s, um, quite some time ago. And in those days, there weren't that many um, civilian simulators around. There was uh, Flight Simulator 3.0, Microsoft Flight Simulator 3.0, um, there'd obviously been uh, versions previous to that, but I kind of joined that at 3.0. And uh, it was a very frustrating thing because there weren't that many uh, manuals around. There's certainly no YouTube and that kind of stuff. Um, so it, it was quite a challenge to get to grips with even that. But one of the things that was highly popular, and there were dozens of games, uh, was Combat Simulation. And as I say, I started 85 onwards, something like that. Uh, one of the earlier ones was uh, this beastie here, Falcon. Um, obviously, some people may be aware of the later uh, versions of it with Falcon 4.0 and uh, the community developed project of Falcon BMS. Um, but the aim of this video is not going to be to compare videos, in, or sorry, to compare flight simulators, um, because DCS for me is a uh, an entity on its own. It doesn't really warrant being uh, sort of compared to other sims. Um, but... You know, in the days gone by, uh, we started with uh, games even more basic than this. Um, but it, I mentioned this because this has got something that's uh, prevalent uh, or rele relevant, I should say, to uh, to modern day simming. Um, this was a very, very early sim, as you can see, uh, very basic, uh, all keybind uh, combinations. Joysticks in those days only had a couple of buttons at most. Um, and so everything was off a keyboard, and quite often the keyboards came with a cardboard cutout overlay that went round the keyboard uh, to give you some idea of what pressing what button did what. But in addition, there are some elements of um, Falcon that actually carry over um, and make you wonder about uh, how good the developers were in those days as well. So, for example, Falcon 1 had a persistent environment. Now, there's a lot of games today don't have persistent environment, but Falcon 4.0, uh, sorry, Falcon 1 did. Um, so that if you killed a SAM site, it would be dead for your three subsequent missions before it came back to life again. So you could do your own uh, anti SAM mission, you could kill the SAMs, and then you could go in your subsequent mission and go and kill the airfield. Great game, absolutely loved that. Um, another notable mention goes to Digital Integration and their uh, game Tornado. This had just the most marvellous mission and weapon planning system. So if I just click here, you can see that you can do multiple aircraft mission editing, you can do low flying planet, etc. and add all the various bits. Um, and some of these haven't really been bettered to this day. Uh, so let me see if we can just... The graphics obviously leave a lot to be desired, as you would expect. There we go. So you can sort your loadouts and it will give you options for loadouts, etc. So really, really uh, excellent, excellent game. And again, this is one of the games during the era when combat sims really kind of ruled the roost, uh, I would say. Um, this is pre-FS98, sort of uh, FS 98, which is when, for me, the civilian simulators really started to take on uh, another level. But the topic of this today is... Uh, Eagle Dynamics and DCS and just to give you a little uh, sort of background as to where it came from uh, DCS I remember seeing uh, DCS in its original format which was uh, SU-27 Flanker um, I had Flanker 2.0 um, but there were obviously various versions of it uh, that developed into Lock-On Modern Air Combat uh, which then had two further versions of Flaming Cliffs 2, Flaming Cliffs 3 uh, and Flaming Cliffs it's uh, significant because it's still really part of uh, DCS and then obviously DCS itself. The first thing I'm going to say is please ignore all of the coloured icons down here. Uh, these colour in as and when you buy each module. It looks like I've bought everything. I haven't. Uh, we're in the middle of the coronavirus lockdown. 
And so uh, ED have very kindly said that uh, people can have free access to the modules for the period of a month. So the first thing really is to look at in terms of uh, what do you get. Uh, and the first thing that uh, is important is to say that what you get to start with is free. So the free download includes one terrain area and two aircraft. And the terrain area is uh, the Caucasus region. And we will just have a quick look up here. So this is the module manager. Uh, these are all of the available aircraft modules and some of the navigation modules and bits. Um, these are the campaigns that I've got. There's others available in the uh, uh, modules in the DLC that you can get. And also there's uh, terrains. Now, Caucasus region is what you get uh, free. And the two aircraft you get free are the down here, Sukhoi Su-25T Frogfoot and the TF-51D Mustang. Uh, and we'll have a quick look at those in the sim. Uh, everything else is basically bought and paid for, so you have to shell out some hard-earned cash. However, we'll have a look at what you get for free first. So cancel that. Instant action. Now, obviously what you've got is a number of modes in terms of the game menus. Uh, you've got instant action, which does what it says on the tin. Create fast mission, which is basically instant action with a bit more flexibility in terms of what you can select. Uh, so you can select where, you can select what aircraft, what you're against, theatres, seasons, etc. So um, if you like, that's a instant action uh, on steroids. Mission is individual missions. So where you've got individual missions for individual aircraft, they come under that. Um, these quite commonly are going to be uh, missions that come with the add-on when you buy them. So, for example, these missions are what you would get with buying uh, the F5E Tiger II. Um, you've also got a tab, obviously, for My Missions, which is where you have uh, any saved missions or anything like that. Um, so, yeah, that, that's missions. Um, so you can have uh, community-created missions, for example, chuck them in there, uh, or you can have missions that came with the add-on there. Uh, campaign series of missions strung together and I can't recall because I haven't really used much in the way of uh, campaigns at the moment um, but I haven't bought that many campaigns the campaigns I've bought have generally been uh, training type campaigns so um, I've got the A10C campaigns for Red Flag, Georgian Hammer uh, but I've also got the basic flight training qualification uh, and a couple of other bits and bobs so some of these are bought, some of these are not. If I go to the AJS-37, uh, which is the Vigan, there's three campaigns here, and I haven't bought any campaigns, so I don't know if these have uh, sprung up as part of the uh, free lockdown stuff or whether they've just um, just came with the, with the add-on anyway. But got campaigns. Uh, you've then got multiplayer, which for DCS is actually quite a big thing. Um, I haven't got the access to multiplayer for some reason. I think my uh, interwebs has gone down. Uh, but you've also got logbook, encyclopedia, training missions, uh, which will be uh, listed for each specific aircraft. So there we go for the AGS 37 Vigan. You've got that lot. Uh, AV8B, NA, you've got loads of them. Absolutely loads of them. And you can see they're all for the Caucasus region. region. And obviously the, that makes sense because if, if you download uh, the sim, you automatically get the Caucasus region for free. So everybody has that region. So what you don't have to do is buy the aircraft and then go, oh, now I've got to buy Persian Gulf. So a lot of them will uh, have that uh, as their default area. What I would say is that the uh, when you're buying stuff, it will highlight if you need something else. Um, so whether it needs a region or, or an aircraft or whatever, it will, it will highlight that you need uh, a another module if you don't already have it, which will bring me on to the module manager in a moment. So the module manager, uh, we've already mentioned it once, but one of the things I do like is that DCS auto updates all of the aircraft. So all of your add-ons, whether it be uh, DCS themselves or third party, because some third party manufacturers create aircraft for the sim, um, so, for example, Heat Blur is one of them, and uh, Razbam are another. They're third-party developers. So what happens is once they're part of the, uh, the the package, if you like, that's on the 
uh, module manager they automatically get downloaded just as if it was something of Eagle Dynamics own making uh, which is really really nice I do like the fact that it auto updates vehicles uh, sorry add-ons I should say because it also updates the maps and everything however what we're going to do is continue our look at what's going on with this and yes I can see that my uh, internet my internet is down at the moment um, so logbook encyclopedia training and you can replay missions if you wanted uh, there's a mission editor which is absolutely crucial we will have a look at that in a bit um, but that's a really beneficial part of the program or the software and then a campaign builder if you want to make your own campaign you could then basically string a number of missions together to create a campaign and that's really the the bare bone basics of the sim so what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, load up a couple of uh, aircraft which are going to be the free ones we're going to discuss those okay so here we are uh, this is uh, the su-25t uh, i've just selected free flight uh, for what we're going to look at and uh, we're going to jump in and get it flying now this uh, represents uh, a couple of things in terms of uh, the good and the bad for me in terms of uh, dcs world so the good thing is we've got a free aircraft, we've got free terrain uh, and we can fly along and jolly well enjoy ourselves. And then it doesn't take much to look out the window realise that it looks beautiful on the ground, the scenery is great, the lighting's great, the clouds are great and you don't need to buy or pay anything extra for the clouds, the weather or any of that stuff that you might do with other simulators. Uh, as I say I'm not going to directly compare with other simulators but it is worth pointing out that everything you see on this screen is free. Now there's a couple of things I'm going to add to that in terms of what's going on. Let me just uh, have a little go at trying to formate on this guy as we come along. Okay, so where are we at with this? Uh, you can see looking at the ground that the textures are nice, the terrain is nice, it's got lovely shadowing from the low-lying sunshine, uh, it's got a lot of um, good range in terms of distance there's no stutters uh, and the frame rate I generally get is about 30 uh, sorry 90 frames whereas in other sims I often get about 30 with uh, the settings that I have on those sims so I'm not particularly great at formation flying but we'll have a little bit of a go with this chap here Likewise, you can see that generally, I mean, I have a, this is, I don't know what you will see it at when you view it on YouTube, but I've got this on 4K um, on my monitor, and I'm getting about, as I say, 90 frames uh, ninety frames a second, which is really quite impressive for the, the level of detail that we've got here. Oh. Never mind, I'm not particularly great at this. We'll just quickly drop down low level. In the meantime, you can see around the cockpit, there's some really good shadows. They're crisp, they're clear. Uh, they move around logically with the aircraft as you throw it around left, right, up, down, etc. Uh, we'll just go down and have a look low level. I tend to get a little bit of my frames are not optimised uh, particularly well uh, in terms of uh, the computer, the system, the, the game, etc. Um, which means I tend to get a little bit of stutter when I go low down. So looking at the cockpit, you can see that the cockpit is um, relatively well detailed, but there's no mouse cursor, and that's because this cockpit is not a clickable cockpit. We're overspeeding a little bit, hence the judder. Uh, but this is not a clickable cockpit, and that in itself is the biggest real turnoff for me in relation to some combat simulation stuff, because when you're in a civilian simulator you can kind of get around it because all the civilian simulators at the moment generally have some sort of clickable cockpit in most of their aircraft um, but if they don't it's not generally a massive issue with a combat simulator you quite often need to um, have quite a complex set of switch uh, switch work going on and for me I found that when I was playing uh, Flanker and uh, Lock-On, I couldn't get to grips with them as uh, games because I couldn't get to grips with the sheer volume and the numbers of uh, keybinds. So let's just pause there. Just controls. And you can see the number of available keybinds. Now, a lot of them won't necessarily be something that you have to keybind. They won't necessarily be something that you have to have. Sorry, they're all keybinds but they won't necessarily be something that you have to use frequently, so you won't have to necessarily memorise them.
but obviously in terms of your controls if you've got a hands-on throttle and stick or a hotas setup any decent stick setup to be fair um, you can obviously allocate quite a few of them to them but in as it stands at the moment with this um, there's an awful lot of keybinds and that was the kind of thing that turned me off a sim that didn't have clickable cockpit and so that for me was a major barrier and I do wonder if that's the same with other people what you can see it is quite nice and smooth down at low level a bit of uh, shadows popping in there but it is very nice and it's actually very smooth as well at the minute it's looking good the lighting in particular is just spectacular as you can see it come through the the canopy there it's got like a halo effect don't really know how best to describe it with the sun but is it kind of uh, diffracts is it or diffracts yeah as you get the sort of diffraction of the sun's rays it's uh, it's wonderful so yeah it's a bit of a turn off and, and the reason that I find it bizarre is because this in effect by being one of the two free aircraft with the sim it's basically the sales pitch to say go out and buy other add-ons um, I appreciate there's a balance in that uh, they're providing this for free and therefore the question would be well why should you invest a lot of money in uh, developing a clickable cockpit for something that is free uh, what's going to be the benefit etc but for me it's a shame um, because for DCS if this is what you then um, download and see you're not really getting a true reflection of the sim um, you are in terms of uh, weather, uh, the mission editor, the campaign system, uh, the community downloads that you can do. Um, you know, you're getting a lot of it, but as a representative of a modern combat aircraft, this isn't particularly great because of that one single factor. Now, maybe that's just me and the challenges I've had in terms of getting into uh, military flight simulation, but yes, yes, whatever. Um, ooh, power, power, power. It's not the most manoeuvrable aircraft. It's basically the uh, the Russian equivalent of the uh, the A-10. It's a bomb carrier, a bomb truck, however you want to uh, describe it. If I just pop outside, you can see the aircraft itself, exterior-wise, is very rustic. I would describe the uh, the graphics. Look at all those weapons, beautiful. Um, you can see it's not the greatest in terms of its uh, 3D modelling, or certainly not in its texturing. The lighting, however is delightful but that's not to do with the, uh, the aircraft so much as it is to do with the sim but yeah really really um, rudimentary compared to some of the other aircraft that are in the sim um, but it is free I suppose that's the way to look at it it's free and therefore do you get what you pay for I guess so as I say for me a little bit of a letdown if you were to look at it as a sales window for, for DCS. Um, and it also demonstrates a, a bar for me or a, a, something that makes it more challenging to get into is probably a better way of describing it in relation to trying to learn the keybinds as opposed to having a clickable cockpit. So without further ado, let's look at the other, the other aircraft that comes with the sim. So here we are. This is the uh, TF-51D. Uh, we're flying over to Tbilisi and I've got my head tracking on now so you can have a, a, a quick uh, impression as to what it's like with these things with track IR in this case. Now it will support multiple different head uh, tracking options it is not essential for the game it has to be said there's a lot of people who will play it just using um, you know coolie hat or whatever a, a, a button on their joystick to look around uh, but for me if you're going to do combat uh, it doesn't half help a lot if you can just quickly look around and you can uh, gain your bearings, gain sight of uh, uh, enemies or look on the ground and see you know what I've done, how have I got on there. So for me, um, we'll mention equipment uh, peripherals fully in a moment, um, but we'll come back to this. So this has got a fully clickable cockpit and it makes a difference, so let me just get it somewhere level because I'm going to take my hands off in a minute. It makes some difference because then what you can do is click things and move things around so you don't need millions of keybinds all you've got to do is learn roughly where something is in a cockpit you can zoom in and have a look so for me this is a much more accessible route into DCS is to look at something like this where um, you have the ability to just click on things and it becomes pertinent because one of the add-ons that you can buy for DCS is flaming cliffs um, so uh, 
in effect Flaming Cliffs was seen as a starter or an intro to DCS. For me it's not because of the fact that it's um, less intuitive to get to grips with in terms of controlling the thing. Uh, what it does do is it tends to offer a simplified set of systems uh, and I believe in some instances a simplified flight model so it won't necessarily be uh, a full fidelity flight model. Let me just uh, centre my view again. Ooh, it's a bit closer than I was anticipating but there we go. Um, so yeah, this is the second of the two aircraft. You can see it's got a very nice cockpit, shadows, shading etc, exactly all the same. Uh, you can see the controls moving around and, and the nice animation within the cockpit and you can also see outside we've got lovely smooth animations there again part of the Caucasus region um, so all of this again free with a sim um, sounding a bit like a salesman uh, but fundamentally it's a free thing to go and have a look at so you can at least gauge whether it's for you or not um, as I say don't necessarily take what's in the free bit as uh, Represent, fully representative of DCS. Um, just the same as, for example, X-Plane. You can have a demo version of X-Plane, um, but the stuff that's free in X-Plane isn't necessarily... While I say that, uh, the 737 in X-Plane is very good, in X-Plane 11, um, but not everything that comes as an aircraft with it, or indeed terrain, is representative of what the machine is capable, the sim is capable of. So yeah, here we are, low level, getting a little bit of stuttering really. Um, as I say, my system's probably not optimised properly for uh, for the... Uh, and I do get that occasional sound bug where for some reason the sound cuts out. And I'm not quite sure why. That was kind of at low level, wasn't it? Never mind. Um, don't know if that's a, just a bug that I've got, but I am running the beta. Now it's important to point out there's two versions of DCS. Uh, both are free. Uh, there's the uh, stable version, so there's uh, 2.5 stable, um, which obviously has uh, pretty much got most of the bugs squashed. And there's also 2.5 open beta. This is the open beta, uh, and it commonly does have the odd bug in it, because obviously this is what they uh, are continually developing before it goes into the stable uh, process or the stable uh, download. So this really is uh, the limit of what you get. So you get a fully functioning uh, SU-25T with guns, bombs, bullets and the ability to go and uh, destroy things. Uh, and you also get a TF-51D which is uh, something nice just to play around in. But this is more representative of um, the actual uh, capabilities of the sim, shall we say. Um, so if I can just get it to balance out a little bit, I'll just pop a little bit of rudder in. Well, it's very sensitive on rudder. I don't really fly this that much. But you can see the, the graphics in terms of both the sim and the add-ons are really... Well, this isn't an add-on, this comes with a sim, but it's very, very good. Very nice. The lighting effects are particularly stunning. Sounds good. Uh, all, all good. But that's, that's the free bit. We're not going to talk about the free bit all day. Um, because that's not what we're here for. Let's jump out of that. So, all very good apart from that one element which was the uh, the accessibility with the keybinds. Um, now, what I'm going to talk about briefly is head tracking and peripherals. Um, I'm fortunate I've got hands-on throttle and stick. Uh, it's a combination of bits from uh, Thrustmaster, the, Warthog, the Thrustmaster Warthog um, and uh, a Verpal Warbird base um, for the joystick and it, you know it's very good but it's not cheap um, and likewise a set of rudder pedals which also weren't cheap but obviously um, there are much cheaper alternatives and there are you know ways into the the sort of uh, throttle hands-on throttle and stick um, which are much cheaper the Thrustmaster I think it's the T1600 or something like that um, Cytec do a number of uh, alternatives um, and I had the Cytec X45 for a while, I think it was. It's now been replaced by the 52. Um, but, you know, it doesn't have to be expensive. But I think uh, to do so without hands-on throttle and stick is quite a challenge in this, uh, in this sim. Can be done. There are people who do it with just a very basic joystick. Um, but what you do need is some form of rudder control, particularly if you're going to fly uh, the propeller aircraft. Because the, the torque... 
uh, that uh, tends to maneuver the aircraft around it's your axis axis needs some sort of uh, controlling um, beyond that really head tracking is nice but not essential um, so you can use a, a thumb hat on a, on a joystick for example to look around and there are quite a lot of people who do that um, and there's quite a lot of people who still do that or do that and then move on to having some sort of head tracking device and as I say it's compatible with a number of head tracking devices including uh, VR I think track hat track clip whatever that one is uh, and um, track IR which is what I use um, I've got VR but uh, I don't I, if I'm honest I don't really use it that often I know people who swear by it and I also know people who just uh, they just say I'll stick with me uh, with my track IR or track hat uh, as per whatever personal want is so flaming cliffs 3 then let's have a quick uh, discussion about that if I go into instant action uh, flaming cliffs flaming cliffs was kind of um, the bit before DCS so if you like flaming cliffs was the package that you bought flaming cliffs 3 and you got all of this and uh, I don't know if it was the Caucasus region I, I assume it was uh, as a package now the difficulty we'll go into the MiG-29 uh, the difficulty was that uh, in those days again uh, for me there was an accessibility issue um, in terms of the cockpit so here we are nice little MiG-29 uh, we can look around with our track IR really nice uh, nice looking thing can even have a look down here at the instruments looks very good now this is uh, payware, um, but in theory this is the entry point for um, the jet payware. And uh, Flaming Cliffs 3, as I say, was a development of uh, Lock-On Modern Air Combat, the original. Um, and it's got, as you saw, 8, 10, whatever it is, uh, aircraft, and you pay for all of those uh, as a single purchase and it's supposed to be an entry into the DCS world in many respects it's simplified systems uh, slightly simplified aircraft uh, less aggressive uh, handling for the aircraft so they're uh, more stable uh, straight more straightforward to fly they generally won't bite you as bad their uh, fidelity of their flight modeling is uh, to a lower level um, but fundamentally they're all you know they're all decent to look at they're all decent to fly um, but it's not they're not the high fidelity uh, highly complex aircraft uh, that some are but and this is the big but uh, no clickable cockpit so you're back to learning key binds with this thing uh, and indeed you are with quite a few of the other uh, flaming cliffs modules I or flaming cliffs aircraft I believe some of them have uh, moved on and some of them are uh, a little bit more advanced and have been redone um, but I don't really know that much about Flaming Cliffs um, because I never really uh, went down that path. But this is kind of your next step on uh, in terms of complexity for handling and weapons and systems and radars and all that kind of thing uh, from the base level DCS. However, it's not necessarily for me the best route to follow uh, and I will explain why. So let's just uh, get out of this so if you like you've got the basic free bit you've then got the option uh, and it's by no means a requirement the option to get the flaming cliff stuff now obviously the benefit is if that you do look at flaming cliffs so if i go back into here flaming cliffs you get an a10 f15c mig 28 uh, sorry mig 29 mig 29 mig 29 su25 su27 su33 uh, and i think there might even be um is that all the aircraft i think there's more than that uh, but i'm not entirely sure now you'll note that this is the SU-25, uh, not the free t So this is the additional SU-25. Um, I don't actually own Flying Cliffs. What I've done is you can buy uh, some of these individually as well. Uh, so for example, I've bought the A-10A, the F-15C, the MiG-29. Um, I think I've bought the SU-27, although I don't really use it. Um, but they are simplified uh, modules, basically but not all of them have um, a, a fully uh, interactive cockpit. So the query is then, well, if you wouldn't go Flaming Cliffs, which I personally wouldn't, what do you look at? Now, there's a couple of things here. Uh, you could look at something where there's really great training support, and you can also look at things where there's a, a really 
modest amount of learning for the aircraft is the best way of describing it and what we'll do is we'll have a look at one of those now so for me uh, the one that started to change my mind in terms of how much I would get out of DCS uh, was the F5E and we'll go into the free flight for the F5E uh, now this is a fairly high fidelity model never flown an F5 so I can't tell you if it's accurate as a representation or not but it certainly feels accurate so this is free flight um, and the first thing you can see is that the cockpit is something that I can interact with directly. Uh, I can also do key binds in terms of uh, using key binds. We don't want to go near you, Sunshine, because you're just about to crash into me. Where have you gone? Okay, let's go and try and formate on you. Where have you gone? As I say, I am rubbish at formation. Please tell me it's not under me. Oh, there he is. So let's go and try and formate on him while we talk. So this cockpit, um, it's obviously hands-on throttle and stick, and the more that you can uh, use your hands-on throttle and stick, whatever your joystick of choice is, then uh, the better it is, or the easier it is, I should say. Um, but this has, uh, you need to learn about how to use the radar, but it's a relatively simple radar. It's not too difficult to learn, uh, but it is quite a challenge to use. Uh, it hasn't got a HUD, it's got a gun sight instead. Um, but what you do need to do as a result is it's not the aircraft that's complex then, you start learning some of the skills in terms of using the aircraft. Um, by which I mean you've got to learn how to use dumb bombs, you've got to learn how to use air brakes to try and get in formation. And not slow down too much. And, you know, it's all about basic piloting skills and having a canopy frame right in the way of where you want to look when you're formating. Woo! Woo, Tiger! This is not my forte and we'll just avoid a collision rather than uh, end the video prematurely. Let's chase after him again. Um, but what it does, does give you the opportunity is it's got short range infrared missiles so you can learn a bit about dogfighting. It's got a gun so you can learn a bit about uh, dogfighting with a gun or ground strafing. You've got uh, straightforward bombs in terms of iron bombs, uh, dumb bombs as you'd call them so you can learn about bombing, uh, rockets, also all the basics. Um, but the systems in the aircraft aren't too complicated so once you've got it up and running it's a relatively straightforward beast. It's not going to bite you particularly hard uh, but it's also not the most... Um, terrifying thing to learn about. The only thing I would say with an aircraft like this is on a lot of the multiplayer servers um, people like to play uh, the most advanced aircraft they have or the aircraft of the moment and this would get eaten alive by things like F-16s, F-18s, F-14s um, because it's a relatively short range fighter, it hasn't got a particularly powerful radar, uh, hasn't got particularly powerful weapons available to it um, but it is an awfully lot, awfully enjoyable aircraft, a terribly enjoyable aircraft is probably a better way of describing it and uh, in amongst all that um, you've also got a couple of campaigns which are available for this one and what you do have is the ability to try and formate on other aircraft like an absolute noob which is what I am. As I say I haven't really been that heavily into DCS before now uh, and I still wouldn't describe myself as heavily into it now but I thought I would uh, make a video because I think it's pertinent to uh, sims that are currently out there on the market. But this is appalling formation flying. I mean I'm not good at it at the best of times but this is a, a good example of how not to do it. And I think that's probably as good as I'm going to go for today. Um, but you can see again really nice fluid aircraft in terms of frame rates. Uh, the sim itself I find to be better on frame rates than a lot of other sims uh, for the comparable equipment so frames that I'm getting in this generally equate to between uh, 85 and 95 with most aircraft um, and in other sims I'm generally looking at 45 to 50 and the, uh, the detail level uh, is not necessarily as good in fact can I see from here options what detail level are we running at uh, we're running at high for most things uh, low for heat blur because I'm not particularly excited about heat blur heat blur there's a lot of things you can adjust in here um, but one of the things that you can do is you can set this to ultra so this isn't even ultra at the moment um, tree visibility I've got for a long way okay, blah 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 
but there's an awful lot you can do in terms of uh, the graphics and you can see you can go low medium high uh, VR uh, which is a, an important one obviously if you want to do VR um, and I would say that this is quite a good sim for VR uh, if that's your bag um, I've had a go in VR for uh, a couple of the sims and it I don't know if it's native if you describe it as native uh, but it's very highly you see the scratches on the canopy absolutely brilliant um, I don't know if it's native VR in terms of the the sim I think it possibly is um, I don't even know what that term would uh, define really to be honest but I know that it does work very well with VR and uh, I've got the oculus rift s I think it is not entirely sure I think it's the s uh, and it works very well with that so that is for me what a medium level aircraft looks like and if we have a look outside let me just try and trim it out so it's not going to crash if we have a look outside you can see that it is absolutely stunning if you zoom in the attention to detail of things like the pilot the airframe all the bits of the equipment that are around it markings I don't know many sims where you can get that close into an aircraft a, a model uh, an exterior modeling and see that level of quality to the exterior modeling it's beautiful absolutely wonderful I think uh, an excellent job was done with this beastie and indeed most of the other payware beasties are very similar um, those that I've bought and paid for wonderful so that for me is a medium aircraft um, not overly complex in terms of the systems and uh, uh, enough to learn um, but not enough to overwhelm I think is the best way of describing it there's two more tiers um, which I'm going to describe now uh, the first one is uh, let's go into uh, my current favorite which is the Aviate-B um, let's see what we've got free flight this for me is um, at the uh, at the opposite end to where we started this is a, a high fidelity uh, model uh, there are different when uh, the developers develop an aircraft uh, in uh, or for um, DCS they can have different levels of modeling so there's like simple uh, all the way to uh, the high level or the the, the accurate levels of modeling so uh, some of the flaming cliff stuff for example is fairly uh, it's simplified flight model and then others are not and this is obviously a fairly advanced flight model I think it's uh, right at the top although I beg to be corrected so this kind of thing has an awful lot more in terms of the systems um, and you can see we start to get tellies, we start to get lots of switches. Now this is one of the more straightforward, um, simplify, sorry, one of the more straightforward complex aircraft is probably the best way to describe it. So what I'll just do, uh, pop it onto autopilot and get it to altitude hold so we can have a look around without dying. So as you can see, as you look around, the actual cockpit graphics quality is next level it really is and the shadows that you get and the lighting that you get they're all top quality uh, you know even just off parts of the, the cockpit you get the lighting and uh, these floodlights turn on you can move them around it's absolutely brilliant um, but when you get into the heart of these things the heart of these things are things like the tellies there's one either side here uh, up front control panel uh, hands on throttle and stick so you need some buttons allocated so that you don't have to take your hands off the uh, the throttle and stick when you're trying to do mavericks drop bombs whatever it may be you need to learn about armaments panels and this is uh, the second for me um, thing that sometimes is a perceived barrier when you have an aircraft like this you need to learn unlike an airliner where you can learn the systems and you can learn about airways flying and you can learn about uh, SIDS and stars and all that kind of stuff there's no SIDS and stars here really uh, in DCS what you do have to do is you have to learn uh, the performance of your aircraft how to fly your aircraft then you have to learn how to operate the aircraft then once you learn how to operate the aircraft you then need to learn how to fight the aircraft uh, and in order to do so you need to learn about uh, different sorts of surface to air missiles SAMs you need to learn about uh, all of the things that go with that so enemy aircraft radar signatures when they come up on the early warning system we'll have a look at that in a moment um, and you need to learn an awful lot in terms of being able to use um, a modern jet and that can seem overwhelming what I would say 
Uh, most of the aircraft come with really, really good documentation. There's some of the flight sim aircraft in civil simulators where you buy the thing and you get absolutely appalling documentation. Uh, all the modules I've bought have had excellent documentation. Um, so, you know, in that respect, so there's an awful lot of material for you there to start with. Then on top of that, uh, there are so many YouTube videos, there's so many content creators who will run through basic tutorials for these things that really it's actually not as challenging to learn as you would have thought. Uh, I'm still in the process of learning this. As I say, I'm a bit of a noob about the whole DCS thing. Even though I've owned all of the iterations before, all you know, I've owned uh, pretty much all of them, I've just never engaged with it because of those perceived barriers. Um, but I'm enjoying it at the moment, so uh, we'll see how we get on with it. But this is obviously um, a new player's perspective. Now the key thing here, um, what I'll do is uh, flip over to the A10 and show you that. The key thing here is to, uh, I would say, have a stepped approach to this. All right, so let's close that. Instant action. Where's the A10 gone? take off because I'm not going to fly around in this because I want to uh, demonstrate a couple of bits. Um, the key thing here is to have a, a, a stepped approach, to have a, a look at what your uh, aims and objectives are, to have a look at the modules that may or may not comply with those um, and to have a look overall at what you want to do. So for example there's no point buying the F-15C if you don't like air-to-air -air combat because that's the only thing that aircraft does. So it's very easy to go out and buy that aircraft and then go, oh, I can't drop bombs. Let's just click fly. Now I've loaded this aircraft. It's had a recent update to the cockpit, this um, which means it looks absolutely stunning. Fly the plane route it's beautiful. The it really is beautiful. Um, yeah, just wonderful. It's a stunning, stunning thing. And actually what we'll do is we'll just pop outside and have a look at the outside of this thing, because the detail on it is astonishing. You know, look at the back of the missiles and the bombs and, in fact, uh, let me try and get a better angle. Have a look at the undercarriage. Have a look at how that's pieced together. Look at the missiles, the weapons, the details, the, the fact that when you get really close into the aircraft it doesn't lose any clarity at all and you can see the different uh, kinds of uh, materials so where the, the gun is at the front you can see it's got that metal shine to it other areas are much duller the way the lighting plays off it it's an absolutely glorious glorious add-on um, but herein lies the challenge working between the two TVs the HUD and then all the potential switchery for the weapons and the variety of weapons uh, and up here you've got the upfront control panel. This is quite a, a monster to try and learn on. And the problem I had was this is the first module I had. Uh, the reason I had it was because in the very early days of DCS World, DCS World was kind of the world that when you bought the aircraft, you kind of got DCS World with it. Uh, you didn't go and download DCS World on its own. Uh, you kind of bought the A10C and you got DCS, uh, the, the environment, the Caucasus region, with it. Um, and the A10C and the KA50, um, uh, the first and second versions of it, um, for example, they were all part and parcel of it. Um, but this for me was the first aircraft I bought. And I bought it out of love of the real aircraft, um, only to find out that it is the most complex aircraft that you could have uh, in DCS in my opinion and therefore the learning curve isn't just steep it's almost vertical if you're trying to learn this thing and even with uh, tutorials and videos and and all sorts of stuff I find that I, I try I start to get a foothold into this and then something in life distracts me um, and by the time I get back to it in a couple of weeks time I've forgotten everything that I've got to or most of what I've got to um, so I've learned to start this thing time and time again uh, I've learned to do gun runs, rockets, GBUs, but now I can't do gun runs, rockets and GBUs and to be fair I'd struggle to start it, um, whereas the AV-8B is for me much more accessible. And this is one of the things, is that uh, it's about understanding not just what you want to do but also a little bit about the module and a bit of research about the module because otherwise what happens is these modules are expensive 
uh, I say expensive. Uh, ED have frequent sales where they have 50% off, uh, you know, 30, 40, 50% off some of their, their modules. So it's not expensive outright, but if you were to buy them at full price, these things are expensive. And you're getting value for money because you're getting an exceptional product, but... Uh, it depends how much time you want to commit to this and I think that's one of the key takeaways is that DCS is all about committing time and effort to it because you will, in order to get the most out of it, you have to learn a lot about it. As I say, SAMs, missiles, uh, electric countermeasures, uh, identification friend or foe, all of these kind of things are part and parcel of combat aircraft and we're not even into the multiplayer environment, which I will mention now. Uh, the multiplayer environment uh, ha basically allows two things. Uh, there are permanent setup servers uh, that you can basically go on. As long as you have permission to go on them and access, you can go on and you can just uh, play. But also, you have the ability to set up your own uh, servers. So they might not, you know, they're not going to be permanent servers. If you turn your computer off, then that server turns off. But obviously, you can set up your own player server for you and your friends to play on or just to play a mission on for example if you and, and just one other colleague or anyone actually you, you allow access to that server you can play on you can do air-to-air -air combat or you can do things where you set the rules in strictly um, you know uh, player versus environment whatever it might be um, but the multiplayer is quite a big thing in DCS uh, much more so I think than uh, than other programs so for example VATSIM and IVAO great as they are in multiplayer Actually, in, in reality, what you're doing is driving something from A to B and interacting with human ATC, which is great, but you're not really doing the same as you would do in a combat sim where you would be uh, working as a team or a pair or a team to uh, achieve an objective against some adversary. Um, in fact, it doesn't actually have to be that because what I'll do is I'll quit out and point out another couple of bits. It's not exclusively military aircraft. So, uh, let's just go for that. Um, uh, let's go free flight tandem. I don't know if I've got my controls set up for that. I'll point that out. You actually have to set up the controls for each individual aircraft, uh, which sounds laborious, but actually it's not as laborious uh, as you would think. Um, but what it does mean is that because different aircraft have different missiles, weapons, cockpits, configurations, um, there's not necessarily one size fits all for um, for the aircraft. So, dependent on the aircraft, it may be that you have the same configuration in terms of HOTAS as you had before, it may be that you have a different one. But this isn't a combat aircraft, this is obviously a civilian uh, biplane aerobatic aircraft. Um, I've never flown, in, in real life I've flown quite a few aircraft, but I've never flown a biplane. Um, I'd love to do so, it'd be fantastic, that sort of open cockpit feeling would be amazing. But uh, yeah, it's it's subtly different to uh, to civilian aircraft in something like uh, FSX, P3D, X-Plane, uh, in that there's not very many civilian aircraft, and although you can do civilian flying, uh, so it has got VORs, for example, uh, available, so you can go and do some navigation flying, it hasn't got uh, airway nav in terms of uh, flight management systems, complex airliners, all that kind of thing, it's just not that kind of sim, really. So, it's the same in almost every program now, not, not just um, flight simulation, but also gaming as a whole. Uh, there is a propensity for designers or developers to release their product into the marketplace in a beta stage. Now, I haven't got a problem with that, as long as when I buy it, it says it's in beta stage. I do have an issue when products are released uh, incomplete, and it's only after you buy it that you find out that issue. Um, so I will say that on their uh, on their downloads, etc., for uh, ED, what they will do is they'll put it as, uh, if you're going to buy it and it's not complete, they'll put it as early access, um, which is great. Uh, the F-14, for example, came out virtually complete. Uh, didn't have uh, 
didn't have many things missing from that but the f16 that's going through at the moment is early access um, and there's quite a bit of stuff that's missing from it at the moment so um, it has limited standoff capacity in terms of air to ground uh, at the moment um, it does have things like lgbs um, but uh, it, it's one of those things where as long as you're informed and you can make that decision it's great uh, when you're not informed, you buy something, you find it's half complete, as has frequently happened um, with both this sim and others. Uh, so I'm not going to mention uh, aircraft sims or anything in specific, um, but what I will say is uh, it's always worth being aware that some games, uh, including this one, will have add-ons that you can buy that are still in uh, a sort of beta phase uh, where they're still adding bits or developing bits so the f18 came out it had limited abilities but i think it's now almost complete if not actually complete um, whereas the the f16 that's just out came out uh, with very limited capacity it didn't even have a damage model uh, that was working at the time so if you took it in air to air it couldn't die uh, you could shoot as many missiles as you want it as and it wouldn't die um, so it didn't have damage modeling which is uh it's one of those things where if it's a combat sim, it's it's kind of um, an essential for me. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it depends on the developer. It depends on all sorts of things that are going on. Um, some are released to market complete. Some are released to market in a uh, still under development stage or an early access stage, however you want to call it. That's exactly the same as any other sim these days. Um, frustrating as it is, uh, I can understand uh, the developers thinking behind it because actually uh, when you've got a small team of uh, developers and, and beta testers in an aircraft that are as complex as some of these, it's very difficult to find all the bugs to squash. Um, so in some ways it's kind of uh, of benefit to both uh, the purchaser and the developer uh, for that to happen because uh, you can guarantee that purchasers will, purchasers will find bugs and they will <laughs> they will feedback when they're not happy uh, particularly if they're paying full price now as i say uh, these modules some are cheaper than others so some of them are, are really quite uh, respectable so things like the uh, yak 52 not particularly expensive don't know the price off the top of my head um, Kristen Eagle, not particularly expensive, but things like the F-14, the F-16 uh, and the F-18, which are the, the high fidelity, high performing uh, elements, absolutely, uh, absolutely stunning. What we'll do is we'll just have a quick look at, um, in fact, we'll have a look at the Harry, but we'll have a look at um, the beauty that is the F-14, and I'm not going to have it airborne uh, for the minute. But we'll just have a quick look at the aesthetics and the graphics because this is one of the uh, the modules that's fairly um, fairly expensive, I would say. Um, I mean, it's not it's not that expensive. There are uh, far more expensive um, aircraft and add-ons in other sims. Uh, I think this is reasonable. I think it's something in the region of seventy or eighty pounds, but don't quote me on that. Um, doesn't look anything amazing at the minute. Uh, you can have the mirrors set up so that they reflect things. I just have them turned off because uh, I'm not that good a fighter pilot to uh, to need to see in the mirrors. Uh, and anyway, with head tracking, I'm probably better off looking over my shoulder. But this thing is an absolute peach. It's beautiful to look at in terms of uh, the lighting, the quality, the instrumentation. Uh, everything is just there. The, the detail in the cockpit is second to none absolutely amazing and this this really is a thing of beauty and for me it's this kind of thing where you know it it really starts to show that you're getting a very high level of value for money for this I mean even the stick is just beautiful absolutely wonderful and you know, one of the other things to bear in mind is that these things aren't always as ergonomically laid out as modern aircraft as well. Um, so it can't find its ADF at the moment. So it's spinning around, having a bit of a look and a hunt. Um, but the radios and the way the light comes off them, so you can barely see the one because of the, the lighting and the reflections. Uh, the canopy is absolutely battered to hell. It's all good, good stuff very nice and if you pop outside I'll just turn my head tracking off for a moment the lighting and the detail are 
second to none. And it's also a beast to fly this thing. It accelerates quickly for its size. I mean, I, I remember reading an article about somebody uh, where they were explaining what it was like to try and land 29 tonnes of aircraft back aboard an aircraft carrier and how truly horrifying it is. But as an example, just have a look at that undercarriage leg. It is an absolute joy to behold. An absolute joy to behold. It's, it's amazing. Um, it's just stunning. The undercarriage, the wheels, the oleos, everything is just amazing. And also, as of note, this is a carrier aircraft. Look at the strength of that undercarriage. That is built to be battered into the deck of a carrier. Amazing. And then if you look inside the uh, the spoilers, you can see the all the actuators and the actuating arms. And beautiful. Really, really nicely modelled. Really nicely made. Flies absolutely wonderfully. Uh, powerful, potent, as good as you ever want. So... Uh, Actually, what we will do is we'll just uh, have a quick blast while we're here. So this is the kind of thing where uh, there's another benefit with DCS. Um, it does happen in other sims. I will say this uh, outright. Um, other sims do have a um, uh, shared cockpit. But this is, the, this is a military shared cockpit where... The two crew can work as, as as a crew in tandem. So you've got a Rio a radar intercept opter, operator, and you've also got. Let me just take that off. You've got a radar intercept officer in the back who can operate the radar and all the weaponry uh, and lots of the navigation stuff. But it's also got artificial intelligence. The voice that was just there was Jester, uh, who's the artificial intelligence Rio. So they've actually done a, an amazing job. Um, in that, if I can remember which button I've got it set up as, you can do things like this and say, go radar silent. And you can give him orders and commands for what to do. And I think you can see, yeah, you can see him moving about in the back there. But this aircraft is an absolute beast. But this is sort of uh, mid to late Cold War. And uh, obviously you can see it's all steam gauges. There's no tellies in here. Uh, but with the help of Jester as a Rio, this thing can achieve a lot of things. But look at that, in terms of the detail. How often do you see that level of detail in an aircraft seat? Look at that. Stunning. Um, that's a testament to heat blur as much as it is to, uh, to the sim. I'm just going to pull over the top now, before we lose too much airspeed and stall out. And, you know, we've been talking for, what, 25, 30 seconds? And uh, we're currently at a oh, bit of a handling uh, yaw there as it had a bit of a, a wag of its nose. Um, what are we at? 29,000? Anyway, let's get out of that because we're not going to uh, demonstrate the final bit with that. So, yeah, um... The only thing I would add within that is the actual number of add-ons available are quite limited. Um, so what we're going to do is just pop into the mission editor. Now this is one of the, the I would say, the, the gems of this, uh, this DCS element, is that the mission editor allows you to uh, upload other people's missions, um, fly them and also modify them. You can create your own missions and in this case I've got a mission that I created and this is a this is a bit of a hodgepodge, this is a training mission really, but basically what I've done is I've got the Persian Gulf and I have uh, spaced around it. Uh, it looks very busy when you look at it, but it only took a couple of hours to build initially and then uh, about three hours total. So two hours to initially flesh it out and then uh, another hour to, to get to the point of where I wanted it to be. And it's relatively easy. The, uh, the campaign... Um, or the mission editor, I should say. I haven't used the campaign editor, but the mission editor um, certainly is uh, is a very good setup, uh, and it's relatively easy to use intuitively. So this looks really busy, um, but here's what's happened. All of these blue bases are bases that, when you start, the map has no colour to the bases, so it doesn't. They're all grey. I'll see if there's any grey ones left. I can't see, but no, I don't think so. But they're all grey. Um, and then what you can do is you can declare that something is a red base or a blue base. Um, and there, from then on, you can allocate 
assets. Uh, you can task them, you can do things. So what I'm going to just quickly fire off in a moment is uh, this mission here, which is an example of what you can do. Now all of these airbases, what I've done is I've set aircraft at each airbase with different targets. So for example, there's a flogger raid coming in here, so this has got an F-16 that comes out from Leeward Air Base and uh, seeks to do an area search and uh, try and intercept that. Here is an air-to-air, -air, so it's simply just got an air target that spawns in in the air. Uh, you start in the base, which is uh, over here at Abu Dhabi International Airport. You fly out, you intercept it, and you have a bit of a dogfight. Um, got the same over here, but what has happened is I've got a MiG-19 here, so it's a relatively easy bandit to fight because it's guns only, uh, early Cold War, Korean War. Over here we've got uh, a pair of MiG-21s, uh, which are sort of Vietnam era. Uh, early Cold War again. Uh, in fact, it went on to mid Cold War, and I think there may even be com countries still operating the MiG 21, um, a very old stalwart of uh, Eastern Bloc aviation. But there's a couple of uh, F 16s and a couple of F 18s available here to go out and target them and play with them. Uh, and then right up at the top, I think it is, I've put uh, a MiG 29 uh, two ship uh, to have some sport with. So basically, what will happen is if you go up here, you'll have a an absolute humdinger and uh, the circles are where I've set surface to air missiles so red is the uh, actual threat zone of that surface to air missile yellow is the detection zone uh, so you'd expect to be picked up and you'd expect to get your uh, EW signals to say well actually you're being tracked by this Sam um, uh, so this is an SA6 and this is one of the things that I think becomes uh, a challenge and the mission editor is great for doing this because in effect what you do is you go well, actually I want to learn how to fight against SAMs um, corresponding, correspondingly what you can do then is go well let's have a look through um, some of the, the stuff that's out there there is vast amounts of uh, information to help you with this uh, this software in terms of this game um, and so I found well an SA6 is uh, radar guarded fairly short range um, and it has a radar uh, unit and then uh, allied to the radar unit it will have a number of launchers and I thought well a couple of things here I want to learn how to how to combat um, radars and I want to learn how to take out radars and also their launchers so this is set up with an AV-8B that takes off from here, flies a very short route up to the uh, up to the north, and in doing so, uh, you have to dodge the SAMs and try and kill the uh, the SAMs. So I'm just going to launch that, and uh, we'll take it from there. So let's just uh, quickly fire up, and what I'll do is I'll do kind of a summary as uh, as we look around things. Oh, my head tracking's gone, is it? Let me see if I can fix that. There we go. Head tracking back. Right. And what we'll do is just centre that and off we go again. So, although it looks complex, this isn't a particularly complex one to module to learn. Uh, the only thing I haven't really got to grips with uh, are laser guided bombs and the T-Pod to designate those bombs, uh, targets and uh, hovering <laughs> which is ironic given the fact it's a, a Harrier and that's its main thing. Um, but I can do the short takeoff and landing so that's all good. Um, let me just see what, what were we doing here. We were going to go to here, going to go to stores and going to turn on the IR cooling and what we've got here is a couple of sidearms which are basically the anti-radiation equivalent of sidewinders uh, and the IR maths so we'll uh, select that so it goes to standby and then over a period of time what will happen is it will eventually turn to ready and over here all we're going to do over here is uh, go to menu set up EW and that's what we're going to be looking for and I'm still not quite au fait with the uh, with the expendables in terms of chaff etc but let me see uh, I think up gives you chaff and flares whereas if you go down it just gives you uh, flares and the ECM I don't know a great deal about this at the moment um, but there we go still still learning um, but the aim of this is going to be to dodge the SAMs and uh, practice dodging the SAMs and to try and get in close enough to kill with the sidearm uh, and then maybe finish off the uh, launchers with a couple of IR Mavericks um, so 
without further ado uh, we will have a look down here uh, I do have some HOTAS stuff set up so don't want cruise yet with regards to that I haven't got this set up so nose wheel steering on it's got two settings for nose wheel high gain and low gain uh, I've just put it high gain so moving the rudder pedals uh, activates nose wheel steering if I press and hold the button um, I get high gain nose wheel steering and I'll just demonstrate that let's go forwards so normal nose wheel steering has that rate of turn if I activate high gain as you can imagine on a carrier you want to be able to turn really tight so that allows you to do that but I actually put it into the high gain mode so that I don't have to hold the button to uh, to use the nose wheel steering so as we're on our way out what we'll do is we'll uh, excuse me adjusting myself mm -hmm. uh, as we're on the way out we'll have a quick uh, quick discussion about where we're at in terms of DCS the first point I would make is it's absolutely free to try it, figure it out, see what you think and there's loads of stuff out there about the uh, SU25T, there's instructions, videos, all sorts you name it, it's there. The second thing I would suggest is it's always worth having a look on forums it doesn't matter what sim, any sim uh, and you will quickly pick up on the, uh, the gripes, the difficulties, the problems that people have uh, what I would say is that most forums are full of people um, who seek advice they're not always full of people who just literally have a uh, uh, you know you don't go into a forum, forum and find uh, sections where they're just uh, lavishing praise on companies people tend to go on forums either f to seek advice or to give advice um, or to express an opinion um, which isn't a bad thing that's just, uh, that's just the way it is so in terms of that uh, likewise, this isn't really a review because I don't think I've had enough exposure experience of um, DCS to uh, to be able to call it a review. Uh, I'm relatively new to actually using the sim, although I've had it in its various iterations for many, many years. Um, this is the first point where I could say safely that I'm actually starting to uh, put the effort in and get something out of it, um, which is very remiss, but then uh, I think... You know that's that's the way of the world. A lot of people are in exactly the same situation, and when you're uh, time poor, then uh, which is a, a an awfully uh, awfully management speak way of saying things. But when you're time poor, um, I don't particularly like management a lot of the time. But when you're time poor, um, sometimes the thing that you uh, put to one side the most is uh, are things like learning this because it can be complex. And that's one of the key things. It depends on which aircraft it is that you're trying to learn. And that's why I say it's all about um, a bit of research, having a look at things and not just following your heart. Uh, following your heart is great, um, but it has to be something that's achievable, beneficial, and that you're going to get something out of. So here we go, and we're away. Gear up. Slowly transition. Didn't need water for that takeoff because... Uh, I had quite a long opportunity to uh, run at it and as we uh, accelerate to forward flight and the wing takes over we'll accelerate ignoring the low uh, altitude warning but now that we're up flaps can stay there should have put them on stall but I didn't but we still survived we survived woohoo okay so at this point we need to consider navigation ah they're ready Woo um, so what we'll do in that case select side arms I haven't got the master switch on uh, navigation we can go boom EHSD uh, navigate that little marker there is where we're heading to that's nav 1 uh, nav steer point 1 don't want steer point 1 we're going to go to 2 which is direct to the target and head up displays don't know why it's taken so long to get into airliners um, but they're an absolute godsend for situational awareness and figuring out what's going on so as I say um, it's a sim that I think benefits most from researching uh, what you want out of it uh, what you expect from it and uh, what you'd get from each tier so as I say uh, in effect it starts with the first tier which is the free stuff the next tier up in terms of complexity and uh, not being too expensive is flaming cliffs I wouldn't necessarily recommend that 
because uh, as I say some of the aircraft are uh, not as uh, fleshed out as we have here um, I'm just going to get it onto the right heading and then I can uh, set it all up for what I want to be doing um, so flaming cliffs for me isn't necessarily the way to go I think the way I went about it in terms of just getting the A10C first was a, a poor decision on my part. Uh, for some it will be fine, for others it will be like me, it will just be a bit of a challenge that uh, we've maybe gone a step too far in our aspirations. Um, I still aspire to be able to operate the A10C with some uh, degree of uh, competence. Uh, I won't claim to be competent with this thing, certainly not at the moment. Um, there's uh, there's a, a very continual learning curve of stuff that available uh, and I think I would actually highlight that that's potentially one of the benefits um, over the civilian bias simulators in that you can get to a point with those where you stop learning but you can continue challenging what do I mean by that but well, once you know how to operate the aircraft you pretty know, pretty much know how to operate the aircraft um, some of them have the capacity to go beyond that in terms of say for example uh, the P3D Majestic uh, Q400 excellent piece of kit because you can also uh, practice what would happen with certain bits of kit failing uh, pulling certain circuit breakers and so on and so forth so actually that's a very good training tool uh, but not only that in addition to being a good training tool it's just a, a really well polished product well worth the money it's actually a bargain for what you get with that uh, that piece of software i think it's astounding one of my all-time favorites in terms of civilian simulation but in effect you know the challenges then become instead of learning the aircraft it are more about uh, flying it professionally getting into certain airports uh, you know for so for civilian um, operations there's some exceptional sims out there but what I would say is that military simulations uh, sometimes have a, a perceived barrier to them, uh, be it the key binding, the complexity, the sheer amount of stuff you need to learn. Um, and that is one of the areas where I think it's, uh, for me, it's been quite a challenge. We don't need this anymore. So we're going to get rid of that. We're going to go to stores. It's going to go to air to ground. The sidearm is selected and that irritating noises uh, the seeker head telling you it's active and it's looking for uh, radar emissions so I sound like I know what I'm doing but I don't actually to be fair just need to make them uh, live good to go right SA6 come up just ahead of us you can see it there you can also see it down here flashing uh, to show it is looking at us I am not by any stretch of the imagination an expert um, I've only really dealt with SA6s and SA8s at the moment, which are both short-range radar tracking. Um, but, you know, it's a, it's a learning curve. And I think that's a, a key takeaway message from here, is that um, in addition to having a look at what you want, uh, managing your expectations and looking for the, the, the add-ons or the areas that might benefit you most, it's also about what you want to get, for it, what, get from it, what you want to achieve, what your aspirations are. When the tone changes, we know that he's got us and uh, he's picked us up and he's potentially launching. So he's looking at us at the moment. And any minute now, he's going to do something. I still don't think I'm within. Oh, there we go, he's launched. You can see the things flashing. And if I zoom in with those superhuman telescopic eyes, you can see the launch has come up. So I'm just going to turn 90 degrees onto him. And I'll put some uh, countermeasures out. It's gone quiet because uh, my electronic warfare detectors can't see underneath. So they've followed me. Put some more countermeasures out. We'll reverse the turn and hopefully they will have not got the energy to follow me. Need to make sure I keep my speed up otherwise, or my power up. Right, let's have a roll back to the left. Yeah, they've both exploded because they lost me. We've got another one coming at us, haven't we? And I'm going to go a different way here, pull hard down here. See what's happening. Oh, he's following. Oh, well, if I can't control the aircraft, which I can't at the moment, I've lost it. He's going to hit us. I think uh, 
We didn't defeat it. There's another one there, so what we're going to do is go down. Should be okay with this. We're really using our energy to try and dodge these things. That's not by any stretch of the imagination how to how to do it. But we're still alive. And hopefully when I get round I'll be close enough for our sidearms to work. There we go. Sidearms away. I'm not going to close any more on him, otherwise my response opportunity, my time available to respond to any missiles he throws at us are it's quite limited, but we've got a very low energy with our speed, only at three, 330 odd knots. So I'm trying to power up and get some altitude so I can respond to anything he does. And yes, I've got the noob labels on where it uh, has the... This is a AGM-65 or whatever. So we avoided that more by luck than judgement. Demonstrates uh, my point exactly. Lots to learn, lots to develop, but uh, you also get a certain ele element of uh, pucker factor in terms of adrenaline when you uh, you know that you've got a bit of a fight on your hands. He's still there, so that missile hasn't hit. Oh, message in the bottom right, he's destroyed. So, uh, at the moment now, all that's left to do is to mop up what's left with the Mavericks, the two launchers. So, let's select the Mavericks. And over here we're going to the dual mode tracker. As I say, I sound like I know what I'm on about, but I don't really. Uh, we'll turn around onto the target and we'll try and get a roll out, roll out. Roll out, try and get out. a target for at least one roll Maverick. Out, and the, having the HOTAS uh, makes a big difference, but actually So, if I do that, do that, do that, hopefully we can pick up a target. There's one. There we go, there's a Maverick away. And because it's dual mode tracker on the nose, I'm not necessarily going to be able to see the missile in terms of through the TV when it hits, but we can look out the window. Boom, he's dead. Um, I'm not going to go after the other one. Uh, I'm going to basically call it quits there. So, long and the short of it, summary. Um, we started with the summary in terms of, uh, yeah, the, the first step in terms of DCS uh, is to figure out, A, whether you want to fly a combat sim, um, and if so, uh, do you want it to be DCS? Because there are, are others available. Uh, there's World War II stuff available in DCS. It's not just modern. Um, but if it's World War II, it's worth looking at DCS IL-2 um, and, a, you know, maybe what's available in that realm. If it's modern, there's only really DCS and Falcon BMS that I'm aware of uh, for modern air combat sims. So really it's down to uh, uh, having a look at the two. Uh, Falcon BMS is... Um, the underlying engine is about 20 years old, but uh, the community that have kept it going have done a marvellous job. Um, so uh, certainly well worth having a look at, uh, but in terms of DCS, and specifically DCS, uh, as I say, take advantage of the fact that uh, the base element of it is free, uh, and then if you decide to go further, make sure you do your research, make sure your expectations are matched with the module, uh, the aircraft or the terrain that you're buying. Uh, it's often uh, something that's worth being aware of is the limitations. So whether something's in beta uh, or whether something is a combat aircraft in the first place. Um, likewise, it doesn't necessarily have to be combat aircraft that you buy to fly in the sim. Uh, but I think given the name is Digital Combat Simulator, uh, I think it's a given that the civilian aircraft, which, funny old thing, are generally a bit cheaper, um, they're nice, but they're, they're not really what the sim is aimed at. Um, likewise, crossing continents is not what the sim is aimed at. Um, so, you know, I hope that helps you guys. Um, as I say, it's not really a review um, because I don't feel that I've uh, got enough experience in it or combat sims, uh, modern combat sims or current combat sims, I should say, uh, to be able to offer a review on it. Uh, but what I thought I'd do is um, 
use the fact that I'm relatively new to actually using DCS uh, to kind of uh, explain my feelings where I'm at with it and uh, the possibilities for anyone who wants to, to look down uh, this pathway. As I say, the, there are a limited number of modules and aircraft, limited amount of terrain. Uh, what's there is generally very, very well done, as I hope I've demonstrated with uh, the F-14, uh, the Harrier um, and whatnot. And uh, obviously also be aware of uh, the difference between a fully fledged product and one that's undergoing uh, beta or early access is the, the phrase used here. Uh, so early access. Um, there are more aircraft being developed. Um, I don't know off the top of my head what they are, um, but there's a, as you can imagine, there's a very long uh, request list coming in from uh, DCS fans uh, for developers to have a look at this aircraft, that aircraft, whatever aircraft. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly if they bring a Phantom F4, I would be ecstatic. I'd be over the moon. Anyway, hope the videos of use to you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you did, please feel free to click like, share or even subscribe to the channel. And uh, I shall hopefully speak to you soon. Take care.